I was born in August 31st, 1939. I was born in a hospital, St. Michael's Hospital in Grand Forks, North Dakota. My parents are of German descent, and uh, they're my mother's grandparents and my father's parents immigrated from what is now Ukraine to North Dakota. They were farmers. That was what their parents did. On a North Dakota farm is where they raised me. My father is John Mathern, and he married my mother, Julia Schatz. I have six younger brothers, no, no sisters. My oldest brother, Richard, uh, was not a military service. My next brother, Gerald, is a Navy veteran. Next brother, Kenneth, did not serve. And the next brother after him is Alan, who did serve in the, ser uh, in the Army. After him is Randy and Stephen. Neither of those served in the military. We lived in a little town, uh, outside little town of Edgeley, North Dakota. And in Edgeley, it had an elementary and high school, which I attended uh, from 1945 till 1957. When I went to college at the University of North Dakota State University in Fargo, my degree was in uh, animal, uh, animal husbandry, it was called. It was an agricultural subcategory. BS degree was basically agriculture. Uh, until I went to college, I didn't have any job other than farm work. When I went to college, uh, I got a job in a men's clothing store, which I worked at through all of my college years. I happened to uh, sign up along with three other fellow high schoolers, seniors in high school in the North Dakota National Guard at my little hometown of Edgeley. I did this in March of 1957, and that fall I attended North Dakota State University. And <clears throat> at that time, land-grant universities required that any physically able or physically fit males had to attend the first two years in ROTC, Reserve Officer Training Corps. So they were cadets, if you will, in studying military service, but I didn't have to attend National Guard drills because the ROTC classes that I attended at the time were more intensive than I would have had to get while I was in the National Guard. When I graduated from ROTC and college degree in May of 1962. I was immediately placed on active duty with the U.S. Army. I was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the field artillery, an Army branch. Uh, a few days later, I got married, and so within eight days, moved on to a new life after college, and I had 30 days to report to for my first duty station to, which was the Field Artillery Basic Officer Course at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. March of 1957 until July of 1990, that's the 33-year window. From 1962, when I got my commission, until I finished helicopter flight school in January of 65, thus was all stateside service from January, excuse me, February 65 until February 1966. I served my first overseas tour. It was unaccompanied, just myself. And uh, it was split between Korea and Vietnam. Then I returned to Fort Rucker, Alabama, the Army Aviation Center, where I served for two and a half years as an instrument flight instructor in uh, helicopters training new students who were getting ready to go to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. In the fall of 1967, I was transitioned into a cargo helicopter, a CH-47 Chinook, in preparation for another tour in Vietnam from January 68 to January 69, where I flew cargo helicopters. Mm -hmm. And then I returned to the States again in January 69 and spent the next year going 
to the Field Artillery Officer Advanced Course, where I studied nuclear weapons employment as one of the many parts of advanced field artillery. And then I had an assignment. My next assignment was accompanied to Germany. My family went with me in March of 1970, where I stayed for four years and three months until June 1974. I returned to the United States and stationed again at Fort Rucker, Alabama from June of 1974 until the end of my active duty service on December of 1976. From December 1976 until July of 1990, I was a reservist in Los Angeles and Phoenix, Arizona, where I served as an instructor. In college, where I had a choice of advanced ROTC, that's the third and fourth year of ROTC, mm -hmm. uh, I could choose either Air Force or Army, which was offered at North Dakota State University. I chose the Army, and along with that Army program, I also received ROTC flight training. So my dream of being a pilot someday was realized while I was still in college. After I finished the flight training program in college, I went ahead and got a private pilot's license and I did some flying on my own after college. Of course, at the end of my college year, I went straight into the Army on active duty. The field artillery was like other uh, branches of the Army was authorized aviation assets. So while I res uh, uh, served in my first uh, field artillery assignment at Fort Lewis, Washington from uh, 1962 to 1964. During that period, I applied for flight school because I was authorized to be a pilot. I could be a pilot if I chose that specialty in the field artillery. And then I went to flight school, helicopter flight school, as an officer in 1964. The uh, primary uh, phase of helicopter uh, course was in Fort Walters, Texas, flying a Hiller H-23D two-seater helicopter. The advanced phase was at Fort Rucker, Alabama, where I flew uh, UH-19s and uh, UH-1 Huey helicopters, they called them. And that was my training there until January 65, when I graduated and had my first assignment uh, to Korea. My assignment in Korea started out with a Corps Artillery Headquarters mm -hmm. where I flew the general and others wow. around with a H-23. They had H-23 Hiller helicopters there. I was one of two helicopter pilots in that unit and uh, I stayed there until like the summer of 65 when the uh, big headquarters in Korea decided to pull us assets that were aviation assets from around various units in Korea and form a new unit with those pilots and air helicopters mm -hmm. and get them ready for uh, deployment to Vietnam. So we did some training while the summer of 1965 and getting ready to go to Vietnam. So we shipped to Vietnam in the fall of 65 and I remained there finishing my tour of duty in Vietnam uh, until February of 66. My uh, airborne training, as they called it, uh, was followed the basic officer course at Fort Sill. I sent my wife back home to North Dakota and I went alone to Fort Benning, Georgia. That was September of 62. My military training started out, the basic training, the most basic training I received was in the North Dakota National Guard, that first summer when I enlisted after my senior year in high school. Mm -hmm. So I learned the basics to fire an M1 rifle and you know, all that. Following that, I went into ROTC, so we learned a lot of stuff, military subjects in ROTC. When I went to advanced ROTC, we had a summer camp in Fort Lewis, Washington, where there were more basic uh, ROTC cadet training, so it was a lot more basics. The M1 rifle was used in World War II, and it was 
a not, about nine and a half pounds, so it was a fairly heavy rifle. Uh, but I learned to fire it at, on the firing range as a private first class in the Army National Guard at summer camp, okay. other than flying several different helicopters in the different assignments in Korea and Vietnam uh, and teaching in the stateside. Probably the most uh, intense other training I had was during the advanced field artillery course. I had to, uh, I had to learn uh, nuclear weapons employment. And my first assignment in Germany was not as an aviator pilot, but in a battalion that was nuclear capable. Mm -hmm. And we had to learn all of the high Cla highly classified and highly controlled employment of nuclear weapons in case they were needed. Mm -hmm. Remember, we were a NATO, in a NATO country in Germany, and back then, Cold War days, East Germany was still a part of the Soviet Union, as was uh, uh, other countries and that, and so we were on alert and had to be ready mm -hmm. in case, yeah. you know, the Cold War got hot. I was commissioned a second lieutenant in May of 62. In November of 63, which was just before President Kennedy was shot, <laughs> I was a promoted to first lieutenant. And while I was in my first assignment from Korea, I moved to Vietnam, and there I was promoted to captain. My second tour in Vietnam in 1968, November, I was promoted to major. And I left active duty as a major in 1976, and I was promoted to lieutenant colonel while I was in the reserves in uh, 1979, I believe it was, or 1980, I can't remember exactly. I chose the military service because I thought it was a very noble career that I wanted to pursue. I had uh, felt that that was an area where First of all, I wanted to be a pilot. I got to be one as a result of my ROTC training and in the active duty helicopter training. So to me, it was something I liked. I liked the challenge. I didn't find it terribly hard. Possibly the hardest part was when I was a young lieutenant in my first artillery assignment after being a farm boy, learning the structured army way and all of, you know, being an officer had to be a leader. I didn't learn much leadership on the farm. So this, this was a challenge for me. And uh, other than that, I, I, I think that uh, there wasn't anything that was particularly difficult. I liked it. I enjoyed the military life and training and experience, travel and all of that. When I finished my helicopter training in January of 65 and was sent to Korea in February of 66. That assignment was to a field artillery, a core artillery headquarters in Korea. And that was a, a assignment, even though it was artillery, my job was a pilot. I was a helicopter pilot in a artil with an artillery headquarters. That was probably uh, where I got both uh, experience in both fields, flying and artillery ways, the artillery, you know, operations. So when I was sent to uh, a unit to prepare us for Vietnam, they formed what was called an air mobile company. And that was purely aviation, no artillery involved, we were put together as a flying company, helicopter company with troop carrier helicopters and armed helicopters. When we got to Vietnam, I flew armed helicopters, QH-1 Hueys, while other fellow, other fellow pilots and other uh, platoons were troop carrying pilots. That was the uh, first infantry divisions first aviation company. My, my uh, first uh, tour in Vietnam with an uh, armed helicopter, we call them gunship platoon in the first aviation battalion, rather. Mm -hmm. uh, 
most of the team, we uh, escorted convoys, truck convoys on the ground. We provided escort service. Also troop carrying helicopters. We provided suppressive fires uh, when they were going in to land troops into a landing zone. And uh, that was pretty much it for those four months that I did. When I went to Fort Rucker then, I was uh, trained as a flight instructor, an instrument flight instructor. So I taught instrument flight in helicopters to new students that they were bringing in to get them ready to go to Vietnam as helicopter pilots. In the fall of 1967, after a little over two years training in to instrument flight to new students, then I was put in a training myself to learn to fly a multi-engine tandem rotor cargo helicopter called CH-47 Chinook. I learned it stateside initially uh, before, right afterwards I was shipped to Vietnam and I spent a whole year. And most of that is, uh, work was to resupply our troops with artillery, ammunition, and all of the uh, supplies needed by units out in the field, in that case out in the jungles mostly of Vietnam. So I ranged from the southern part of Vietnam to almost the north end, not quite, but the, the main central highlands was our major, major area of operations. Oh, a typical day would be to uh, uh, get up real early while it was almost still dark yet and uh, pre-flight helicopters and uh, go out to a briefing site uh, where we were briefed on the mission and it was probably, as an example, to move an artillery fire base from one mountaintop to another. And uh, with the Chinook, uh, it has a external hook where lo uh, loads of our artillery cannons and ammunition were on a pallet or made with a, uh, put together with a sling load and uh, we would fly a Chinook down above the load where a, a soldier would hook uh, the, the loop underneath and we would pick it up and take it to a mountaintop maybe uh, and set it down and drop, release the hook and it was there, went back for another load. So we shuttled these loads of uh, supplies and the actual artillery that they needed with its ammunition. And troops were moved also, and that the, the troops would sit inside the cabin, of course, uh, in the troop seats. But the typical mission was resupplying, because we carried the cargo, the heavy cargo that was needed for, you know, support the tr infantry. The most efficient way to move supplies is, is, is if the supplies were on a pallet with a sling around it, a netting type sling that could be hooked because that was, it didn't require landing and moving stuff in and out of the interior of the helicopter. If you could pick it up and drop it, uh, just using the hook on the outside, that was the most efficient way to transport supplies. Mm -hmm. And troops had to be, of course, transported inside. And a lot of s small supplies like rations, uh, food that the troops consumed, that had to be inside. But, 180th Aviation Company, Assault Support Helicopter Company, it was called. We were part of a division. We were part of a core uh, level, which is really they had the uh, aviation group. The core uh, had group helicopter groups under it and some divisions, but ours was under the first aviation. There was definitely hostility, uh, but uh, we avoided any, I happened, my unit avoided any uh, serious problems because the Chinook with the twin engines and tandem rotor, it was able to climb pretty high and tra uh, traverse in route to its drop off point at higher altitude. So we would climb up to altitude when we picked up the load, we would fly to a destination, then descend down over the destination, avoiding that uh, uh, area in between, you know, departure and de uh, arrival point or destination point. Uh, so I got no bullet holes in my helicopter in my second tour. But my first tour, I took 11 bullet holes in my Huey uh, arm ship. And oh yeah, you could hear the bullets popping. When they were close, you could hear them. 
truthfully, uh, that was luck, I think. Uh, most of the bullet holes in the helicopter were in the rear from the tail boom engine area. Only one bullet came through the instrument panel in the cockpit and missed everybody. So I was very thankful that I made the tours in Vietnam without a scratch. My, f my first tour of four months was in a UH-1B helicopter, B model, and uh, it had, uh, my own ship had rocket pods on the side and a 40 millimeter grenade launcher uh, installed in the nose. And uh, of course I had door gunners on both sides of my helicopter. And our platoon was divided up into, uh, I guess it was three or four, we called fire teams, two helicopters, it was a team. So I had a team of uh, another helicopter which had uh, door guns and uh, flex guns, machine guns that could flex on the sides. And uh, we were a team, and so that's how we operated. Those, those varied a lot, and they sort of had to be, uh, let's say, applied to meet the situation. Uh, it depends on where we were. Uh, whether we flew down in the Mekong Delta, uh, flying down the river, uh, above the river, looking for uh, v uh, v uh, VC, Viet Cong, they were called at that time, in their boats on the river. Uh, we had one rule of engagement that was usually done at night, and we had a helicopter with a big searchlight shining the light down and the, the gunship with uh, the machine guns and so forth was uh, flying low and, sl and, and you know close to the ground and was able to, without lights by the way, uh, attack the uh, bad guys. Usually there were two ship, uh, two team, uh, two aircraft uh, in a team and they operated in different ways. Uh, that was a little different from, uh, like I say, escorting a convoy of trucks. Uh, if they ran into trouble, we would, you know, try to put, apply suppressive fires. Uh, in other words, uh, whether it was rockets or uh, machine guns or whatever uh, we applied uh, weapon-wise. When we first got to Vietnam in the fall of 1965 with my first tour as a gunship pilot, we were given in-country orientation, if you will, by vi uh, visiting a unit who had been in country for some time, had learned a lot about the situation. So flying in Mekong Delta, we went with the, we, were, we didn't take our own helicopters. We were, as pilots, flying with them in their helicopters, and they showed us how they did it. Uh, uh, night raids on uh, Viet Cong in their boats on the Mekong Delta uh, down the rivers and so forth. They showed us how. So that when we uh, got back to our unit now stationed north of Saigon, by the way, uh, near f a town of Fuloi, that's where we went on our own missions after we had this training, orientation training by the experienced troops our helicopter company that happened to be stationed at Tan Sinut Airport on, at Saigon. Uh, Vietnam was the first uh, uh, war that used extensive helicopters. Uh, you may know that in the Korean War in the early 1950s, there was a TV movie, MASH, that we used to see the little helicopters with uh, uh, litters on the side, picking up wounded out in the... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, combat areas and bring them in the hospital. But that was minimal use of helicopters in that war. So, but that was the first uh, thing and that's where they started. But by the time we got to Vietnam, they had developed uh, better, more capable helicopters that we used. Well, that was probably another uh, very helpful uh, thing, uh, improvement and technology uh, we had in those days. Uh, besides the normal mail of uh, sending letters and packages back and forth from the states that would take, you know, maybe a week or two or three, whatever. We had little tape recorders about this size and it had three inch reels of magnetic tape. And so 
My wife had one, and I had one in Vietnam. It was easy to keep because of its small size. And we, with a microphone, uh, would speak into the tape and send the tape back home, or my wife would send one that she and my children would uh, talk on and send it to me. So we had, we could listen to family member voices, it could hear each other on tape, and that was a big morale booster for uh, service in the Vietnam War. A lot of soldiers used it. My first tour of four months over there, I had one daughter already, and my younger daughter was born in October of 65, and I didn't meet her until I got home in February of 66. She was four months old when I first saw her. The service was really helpful. I, I mean, the, 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 everything was done, you know, because we had aviation assets, uh, supplies could be flowing around back and forth for soldiers. We had PX, post exchange with all kinds of, uh, what do you say, comfort items, not only foods and beverages, but man of life. Not only did we have these tape recorders that we could send reels back and forth, we even had larger uh, speakers and tape players and uh, electronics to you know, make, uh, play music and so forth. So uh, the Vietnam War was nothing like the Second World War when it came to technology and everything that was provided. You know, while I was training in the United States, I always, I either lived at home when I was in a particular unit or lived in an apartment when I was in flight training or whatever. In my first year uh, uh, tour in combat in Vietnam, we slept in, we had tents uh, back in uh, north of Saigon where I was first stationed. It was like an old abandoned airfield that the Japanese had built during the Second World War. We just rehabilitated that old airfield, which we had to pitch our tents and dig trenches around so when it rained, it didn't flood us out. And we spent the whole time in tents, the four months. When I went back for my second tour of a whole year, I was stationed at the little village called Phu Hep on the central coast of Vietnam. It was basically on the beach. It was sand everywhere. American troops uh, had been stationed now in Vietnam from in 19, I mean, initially when the troops went in, when we went in 65, there were a whole lot more by 1968. And so, there was a lot of area built up. There was an Air Force base uh, built uh, about three miles north of ours, and they had buildings. They were wood structures, and we started building wooden structures as well at the Army facility. We even built an officer's club, we called it, with lumber that we were able to acquire that, uh, that was just available, and it was a whole lot more comfortable. We had our own officer quarters, if you will. <laughs> While I'm overseas in the, uh, during the first tour, of course, it was always on military installations. I was never, uh, uh, let's say, billeted in a, on the economy. We had military installations and we had facilities like volleyball, basketball, and Korea. There was a rec center near uh, Seoul, the city of Seoul, and uh, we had our own uh, courts uh, to play ball and so forth. In Vietnam, uh, we put up a, uh, you know, a couple of poles with a net, so we had volleyball to play with. And uh, we played cards in the evenings, but there wasn't a whole lot of recreation other than we're pretty busy, so when you had a chance, you slept. <laughs> didn't do all that much, but if you had a few days off, then you'd get involved with outdoor sports, mostly. The first part of my first tour overseas it went in February 65, and Korea's got snow at that time. So it's cold, but it warms up, and we had rain and pleasant summer weather. You know, it's pretty much like uh, uh, the Midwest uh, in uh, Korea. Vietnam is uh, hot and humid. Uh, I was there from the fall. Uh, it's actually, the fall was actually a dry season, so we didn't have a lot of rain. The first uh, 
fall when I got there. It started to get more rainy as I progressed around the beginning of the year, January, February, 66. Uh, in our case, at the time I was there for my first tour, we weren't grounded much at all. Uh, it was fairly dry. My second tour, where I was there a whole year, uh, we had intermittent rains in the spring and fall, pretty much. The summer, again, was rather dry. Being a Roman Catholic, I had a St. Christopher medal that I hung on my dog tags for good luck. <laughs> I was lucky, I never got scratched. Oh, I would definitely say that my tour in Europe, in Germany for four years and three months was the most enjoyable because I had my family with me, watched my kids grow up, and we got to see a lot of uh, Germany and other uh, European countries, uh, you know, got to travel during, uh, take, you know, when we took leave, everybody's authorized 30 days leave in a given year in the military. And so we took advantage of that. And, you know, weekends, we also had time off often, and we got to see and do a lot of things and experience. You know, we learned to ski in the Alps, just got to visit Switzerland, Spain, France, uh, various places in Germany and so forth. So that was a great experience. I really enjoyed that. Let me say that my first tour of just four months in Korea as a lieutenant, uh, you know, out of flight school and really the beginning, the early years of the Vietnam War, uh, I was optimistic. I felt we were doing the right thing. Uh, it was uh, you know, the Kennedy administration started us going to Vietnam and the Johnson administration uh, kind of finished it, if you will. Uh, not, did, not quite finished it, but built it up. And that first tour through 19, like I say, to February 66, I was optimistic. I went back to Vietnam in January of 68. And during that whole year of 1968, we you know, we had new, uh, army newspaper, or military newspapers, and we heard on the radio all the strife in the United States. There were all kinds of protests at universities and colleges over the Vietnam War. Uh, Martin Luther King was shot, I think, in March of 68. Bobby Kennedy campaigning for president was shot in June of 68. The, the year 68, especially in the fall, had all kinds of race riots in Los Angeles and other uh, cities. It was a year of tremendous strife. And when I got home from there in 69, I really had the opinion that the Vietnam War was a mistake, a big mistake, because there was so much opposition in the country, uh, politically and economically. It was just a terrible time. So, uh, you know, uh, entering the active duty right out of college and getting married, and a little over a year later, having my first child. I learned a lot together. I learned a new way of life, my career, learning the Army military way of living and operating. At the same time, I'm raising a new family. Uh, so I learned a lot of life lessons, getting you know, family life and so forth. I had two daughters. Uh, no sons, so my wife and two daughters were kind of one side of a lot of home issues and I had another side, so I had to pretty much go along with what my female family, uh, rest of my female family uh, felt. But I learned how to cope with that and deal with that and that wasn't all that tough, but there were challenges, no doubt about it. The change wasn't much going to college because while I uh, was in college in Fargo, North Dakota, and I had a job in a clothing store. Every summer I would come home and work on the farm because it was harvest season. So I didn't really, plus I visited during holidays, so I didn't see a big cultural change. I was still a farm boy, I just happened to get some time off to go to college. But after I left college and went to the Army, that was the big change. That was the big cultural and whatnot change for me. I feel that uh, everyone who's a citizen of the United States and enjoys 
the freedoms and opportunities and, and the economic uh, benefits of living in this country uh, has a responsibility to give back, to pay for, with time and energy to give back to the country. Service to the country in some form, and there are many forms, you know, military is only one of many, people in the medical profession, in the security professions of police and, uh, and so forth, teaching, education, all of those, uh, I feel that everyone has a responsibility to give back to the community where he lives and maybe the country as a whole, working in some form. Volunteering uh, probably is the most important when you feel a, a need to give back. You don't have to be paid for it. You can volunteer. If you have the economic means, you should volunteer. And so to me, everyone has an obligation to give back to his community in some form. Thank you.